without the community, um, we wouldn't have any of this. So I think it's really important to not take stuff as our own without citing where it's coming from. I read very, very fast, incredibly fast. Um, <laughs> I also talk very fast. I write very fast. Um, I'm, I'm crazy about being super efficient, like insane. And then I get an email, I think from Matt Cutts, like I have people at Google that want to ban your website for doing this. I'm like, honestly, I totally forgot about it. But if you feel like it needs to be banned, fine, I'll remove it. it was, so those are like my first memories of using search is in high school and college days, um, mostly for manipulation of people and to do well in school. <laughs> Hello and welcome to SEO Pioneers. Today I'm speaking to Barry Schwartz, who needs a little introduction as the founder of Search Engine Roundtable. And Barry has been tirelessly reporting on the search industry for the best part of 20 years. Very excited to be speaking to Barry, and I'm sure he's got a lot of really exciting, interesting stories to tell us today. So, um, hi Barry, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I I'm love good. your interviews, <laughs> honored to be part of this pioneer's journey. It's not that I consider myself a pioneer, but I love your interviews and thanks for doing them. I appreciate them. Thank you. That's really kind, Barry. So going to jump, uh, go right back to the very beginning. And so I believe that you established a software dev company in about 1994, and then you started to be aware of search engines in the late nineties. So if you could just go back and perhaps talk me through those early years of setting up the software company and then how you actually became aware of search? Yes. So yeah, it was 1994. I was actually 14. I have a twin brother named Ronnie. Um, we went, we were in high school together and he was a big computer geek. Um, and he was just like hacking websites together back in 1994, not using like front page or any of those old tools, but using, you know, just pure HTML and stuff like that. Um, I remember, I guess, sometime in high school, I went. We had some business class. It was basically the the basketball coach had a, like a business class that he taught because uh, he ran his own camp. So he was like, oh, "I'll teach a business class to whoever's interested." So I went to that basketball uh, that business class in high school, and I'm like, oh, "I'll make a rusty brick business plan." We had our, you know, in high school, I'm coming up with a business plan for rusty brick. I wish I had that. That would be like really cool to see, look back at that business plan that it was like maybe one page. Um. So it goes back to when we were in high school. So that's uh, pretty fun. Um, he basically, my brother was making websites and I went ahead at some point, like, you know what, I'll go to meetings and I'll, you, you build it and I'll try to sell it. Um, and it went, well, went out well. Um, and then I think um, the first time I like looked at search in a big way, it was funny. So actually in high school, probably, I don't know, 10th or 11th grade when I was like 15 or 16, um, one of my teachers like asked us to do some type of report on something i forgot what it was and i'm like i brought up like maybe alta vista or one of these searches i don't forget what search engine was and i think it was alta vista um, and i did some searches for it and i found this big you know academic uh paper on the topic he was looking to write about so i downloaded it i printed it out and i told him hey i didn't write this obviously, because there's no way a 14 year old or 15 year old could write this like academic paper. But I found it. And I thought you'd find it interesting. He was like, this is gold. How do you find this? Um, and I'm like, I use search. And he had no clue what that was. Um, and then uh, he gave me like, I don't know, an A for that report, even though I didn't write it because he was so happy with it. Uh, and then I'm like, wait, I could actually use this search engine to find out fun things. So I don't know. I think I had one kid in my class who came from like a famous family. So I did like some searches and I found all this like history around the family. And I was just like, kind of like my, my, my humor is kind of weird and sarcastic. So I kind of used bullet points to like, kind of like make the kid like go, like think like I'm kind of like stalking him and I know information about him that nobody else knows. Um, and that I could get his social security number and his bank accounts, all that type of stuff. Um, and that's what SEOs joked about in the early days. You don't want to mess with SEOs because you know, we could get everything about you and like ruin your life. So I kind of like did that before there was SEO when I was like a teenager. Um, just as a joke, because I thought it was funny. Nobody else knew how it worked. Um, so those was my early fortes. And I think I found Ash G's back when I was in college. Everybody was actually starting to use, I think it was like 99 or something like that. Um, and everybody was using 
or 2000 or something like that, 1999, 2000. I think good people were using, starting to use Google then. And I'm like, oh, SGS is way cuter. Uh, it's a butler and so forth. So I'm going to, I'm going to use Google. I'm going to use SGS and you could use Google, although I was wrong back then. Obviously Google was a big one, um, but I was only in college. And um, so those are like my first mem memories of using search is in high school and college days, um, mostly for manipulation of people and to do well in school. <laughs> So you've said before how you, you know, you really fell in love with search engines. Um, you know, what, what was it? What, you know, really hooked you in? Did you fall in love with them straight away? Did it bite you, the bug? So no, early on, it didn't. I was still a teenager and I'm like, I, think, I thought it was cool and fascinating, but it was a lot of like stuff that I couldn't even read. The stuff it found was, you know, really obscure stuff. There wasn't much great content on the web back then. Um, so for a teenager, it was pretty boring, but when I started to go to college and then, uh, started to do a lot of, you know, development work, web development work and design work, um, clients became more interested in it. And I think one client referred another client to me saying, you know, everybody back then in the late nineties were like, if you knew how to turn on a computer, you were a computer geek and you knew everything about how everything worked on the internet. So they're like, oh, this person knows the internet, ask them how, how ask Barry how search works. I'm like, I don't, I'm not really sure. I know I use search engines, but I don't know how they work exactly. So I did some searching and I found a bunch of online forums. Um, I found a lot of uh, papers and stuff like that. Um, obviously, Danny Sullivan's site um, and so forth. And I just did a lot of research and I found it fascinating, the SEO community and what they were doing. It was before I think it was called an SEO community, but it was just fascinating to see how SEOs were like in the forums, watching how Google's changes were happening in real time by IP address. So, you know, this server was changing and the rankings were going here and the page rank scores were changing over there. And everybody was like, so like on top of this stuff. And it was just like, I don't know, everybody was getting together just to watch how they would make the next buck on Google search or how they would see their rankings go up or down. Um, and it was just fascinating to watch the, cha the industry change so fast, especially in the, in the early days. But it's changing very fast these days as well. So I think that's when I kind of got hooked when I started to see how, like, I guess, SEOs and like early, I guess what you want to call them, I don't know, just like people who are in their basements trying to like make a buck off the internet or just trying to like hack the internet because it was interesting, watching them just obsess about it and be like, wow, this is something really, really interesting. So of course you do your own thing as you, you experiment yourself and you, you, just, you get hooked yourself. I'm sure you have lots of stories to tell yourself about like, things you've discovered and hacks you found or weird quirks you found with Google or other search engines. And it was just super fascinating to watch you go through that same experience as Google and other search engines were changing and how that was impacting your sites, your client sites. I think that just, you know, got me hooked. Do you think, I mean, obviously, because, you know, you grew up in a, a pre-internet, pretty much a pre-internet, pre-Google world. Did you, when you, when you first picked up on search engines, did you actually realize how important they were going to be and how much it would change everything? Or did you- That's a question. No, I was too young. Um, like now with this whole AI, GPT, generative AI stuff from Google, Bard, whatever you want to call it, I see how important that is. And I, I keep, I tell, I tell people, even like family and stuff and friends, this is big. Uh, this is probably as big as search, maybe bigger at one point in the future. This is as big as is almost as big as the internet. Uh, but when I was doing search back then, I didn't know. I was just a kid. Um, I was literally, you know, 16, 17, 18. I really did not know. So um, I can't, I'm not one of those people like that could say, like, yeah, I, I, I saw this coming. I think you interviewed um, uh, Bruce Clay and he, he saw it coming, but he had years and years of experience. I was just a, a little kid, you know. I could I could be a son, I guess. <laughs> so um, I didn't. I couldn't. I cannot say that I saw search as being that big. In fact, when Google IPO'd, I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna, you know, buy their stock and make a bunch of money money on it. Oh, ninety nine percent of their income comes from just search ads. I can't go ahead and buy a company <laughs> stock that just depends on search ads, and they're not diversified at all. They don't know, you know, that's everything. So I bought like two shares just to have token shares. Um, and that's one of my best performing stocks, even though it's only two shares uh, since, uh, since I started investing, although I did buy Apple when I was like 16. So that's by far my best stock, but Google, I mean, I didn't think Google would be big even when I was on the IPO, which was 
what, 2004, 2005? This is even after I started covering it, which is pretty interesting. Um, I mean, I thought they were big then in terms of search, but in terms of like a big company that would change the world and everybody would depend on them. Obviously now they're a whole, totally different company, but it's always fun to look back and say how you know dumb I was, I guess, in the early days. I, I always find it really interesting because, I mean, I obviously was brought up in a pre-internet, uh, pre-Google world where you actually had to go to libraries and, you know, talk to people in person and things. Um, and I'm actually quite, I see that as a good thing that I, I've been able to see both sides, whereas obviously, you know, if you're brought up today and these days, you have no idea, you don't, you have no concept of a life pre-internet. And so I think for me, it's been interesting because I've really watched that transition of the revolution, like the digital revolution. And I find it, I always find it really fascinating that the majority of people are walking around and they don't have that concept of the the digital revolution and how much it has changed everything. Um, yeah, I, just... I agree. It's, it's super, I mean, I was like, I grew up, my father had the old computer with the phone that you put on the receiver that made that noise to get onto mm. the internet. Mm. Um, so I was always, um kind of internet i mean but it was like really prehistoric internet um so i kind of grew up with the internet maturing which was i think a really great time to grow up mm. yeah so uh when did you start to get involved in the forums you said that you were having a look at the beginning just to do some research is that right yeah, so I guess I did some research. I discovered some forums, like um, early forums, I guess it was like Jim, Jim's World, um, Creative Site Forums, Webmaster World, uh, Joe Whalen's Forum, High Ranking Forums, I think it was called. And then later these other forums came up, like SEO Chat and other ones. Um, and um, I think that I discovered, you know, personalities, you know, some that you've interviewed, like Mike Graham. Um, he had a book out I think at that point yeah mostly covering like how search worked the patents behind it and stuff like that um and um also I think I read Sherry Thoreau's book it was a much more it was like kind of like a white hat book of how to do SEO which was really the fundamentals around making sure your sites are you know easy to crawl and you have good content you get links to your site so I remember those books and they were like the, some of the early people who actually produced content outside of Danny Sullivan around that topic and then after I read like Mike's book, I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. I dug into all these search patterns, which I think a lot of early on SEOs did. They printed out these search patterns, trying to understand how link graphs work and how search engines crawl the web and all this type of stuff. And I remember sitting like, I don't know, as a 19 year old doing like basketball scrimmages um, and I'm sitting in the stands waiting for my turn to go on the court. I'm just like reading patterns while I'm waiting uh, to get on to get on to play basketball. Um, and, you know, following the forums, people's the Google dances in the old days, people coming up with like these hacks to see remember like the early sandbox days where people were like, if you put in this query, you can see the pre sandbox results. If you put it in this quick way, you can see the, the post sandbox results. Uh, it was just super fun. So I think it was like 2001 or so when I started to like get involved on a day-to-day -day basis in the forums, I forgot which one was the first forum I went to, I think. If I'm correct, I think Joe Whalen actually banned me early on because I was <laughs> dropping links to a tool I made called Google Count, which then Google sent me a legal cease and desist to stop using the name Google. So I changed it to SEO Count, which was one of the first, I think it was the first ranking tracking tool that used the original Google search API to do it in a legal way. Um, and then Digital Point came out with their free tool, so that killed that business. And then you have all these other tool makers like Rand Fishkins, Moz, you know, SEO Moz, and so forth that came out afterwards. So those were like the early days of, of me getting into the SEO space. Just just to slightly diversify, what because I find it really interesting that you're not a practicing SEO, and so when you were learning all this knowledge, did you never think about? getting into SEO yourself? I mean, were you experimenting yourself? For sure, I was. Um, I definitely experimented. So um, I think um, early on, I know I did a lot of things to like experiment. I tried the content stuff. I did, you know, certain things. I think that things that worked was very interesting. So Digital Point, I don't know if you remember that website, uh, Sean um, from Digital Point made this Digital Point co-op network, which is basically kind of like a, 
a private blog network or some not really private, but kind of like a link thing where you link, the more links you link out to, the more links you get. So I created that and I started using it and I was able to literally rank for like mesothelioma, one of the most competitive keywords back in like early 2000s. Um, I was like ranking number one for that keyword. I didn't really monetize it too well. At one point, I'm like, I, when AdSense came out, I was like, let's see if AdSense can actually make some money on it, do some AdSense on it. But then I removed it quickly because I just wanted to experiment to see how these things have, you know, how these things actually interact. And so you see somebody talking about something in a forum, you want to see if it actually works when you report about it. So I did a lot of that. I remember I early days when people would create like, like Dory pages, I guess these days, they call them Dory pages where you create a page that says city name and then the keyword you want to rank for. I don't know, so let's say it's like, I don't know, web design in New York or web design in this city or whatever it might be. So I went ahead and I uh, went ahead and hacked together, I don't know, probably like 20 different content templates with the city name and with keyword term and put it on my website. Um, it worked for like a minute, then it stopped working after Google figured it out across not just our site, my site, but that was working well. And then I tested it, it worked well, then it stopped working. I forgot about it, that but those pages were there. Uh, and then I get an email, I think from Matt Cutts, like I have people at Google that want to ban your website for doing this. I'm like, honestly, I totally forgot about it. But if you feel like it needs to be banned, fine, I'll remove it. it he knew it wasn't ranking anymore, uh, but it was a clear violation of Google's guidelines. Although when I did initially, there were no guidelines. I'm sorry, I did initially, there was really, really Google guidelines against that. But um, it was me saying, all right, how can I test what people were doing in the SEO forums that said that where they were saying this works or doesn't work? I did a lot of that in the early days to see, you know, is is it what people are saying in the forums actually going to actually work? And it did work for a little bit um, until Google, it was like a cat and mouse game, as you know, like people did this, Google caught on it, got rid of it. Um, so I remember getting that email from Matt Cotts. I'm like, and I tell my development team, like, is that still there? Like have you, we redesigned the site three years ago. We actually templates were the, from the old design on some like subdomain that we had. Um, and now you would never do that. You never do anything like risky like that on a website. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think those are some examples of stuff that I've, I've tried. And of course, producing content on a daily basis, making websites that have public facing stuff. Um, you have to think about how you can make those pages search and friendly and all the basics around SEO. I mean, the basics of SEO really haven't changed from the early 90s, or late 90s to today. You want to make sure you create web pages that have good content that can be crawled by an index. Back in the old days, people would create pages where you click on a URL. Every single time you clicked on, let's say you clicked on a category page for, I don't know, blue sneakers. Every time somebody, a user clicked on that blue sneakers link, you would create a new session ID and a new URL. And that would confuse the heck out of Google because every single time somebody clicked on that blue sneaker category page, you would have infinite number of URLs. Those are the old ways CMSs or content management systems and e-commerce platforms would create web pages. They would create web pages using dynamic uh, user session IDs. And that would just create a ha create havoc for Google and search engines. It's like the most common sense now, but back in the late nineties, nobody even thought about that. It was just like programmers building websites that work for users and users didn't really care about the URL back then. That was doing SEO. And in the early days, we would build websites that would be search engine friendly. And that was novel in the, in the early days. Now, I mean, we didn't do SEO for them in terms of doing link building or content marketing or any of that type of stuff. We just made sites that not only were their back ends efficient for the companies, but also making sure the front ends were actually delivering experience that search engines could crawl. So, I mean, did you never, did you never experiment with offering SEO to your clients or did you not want to? Was that not a path for you? Um, I think once or twice we kind of did, um, but I did not want to. Um, I, I think we did it like some clients said, please, we need help, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't have the time one to do link building. I don't want to hire a link building company. I don't want to do content marketing. We are good at building out software. Um, a lot of our software applications, not all of them, maybe like, I don't know, 30% of them um, um, are, what's it called? Are, are have front facing stuff. So you have to make sure the front facing stuff that Google could crawl or search engine could crawl are search engine friendly. But at the same time, um, at the same time, um, you have to also, I'm reporting on it and I don't want my reporting to be biased in any way. Meaning there are many examples of Google coming out with a statement saying this technique that SEOs have been using forever for a long time is no longer something that, or it's, it's something that is against our guidelines. Like one example is guest blogging. 
back in the old days, guest blogging was the number one SEO link building tactic you could do. Um, and when Google came out with that, I remember reporting, this is what Google said, guest blogging, I went through the statement and I basically said, this is not allowed. And then you have other SEOs who are doing blogging um, that have a business that sell SEOs. And they're saying, yeah, Google said guest blogging is a no-no, but if you do it this way, then it's okay. <laughs> you're like, oh, because that's the way we as a company do it. That's okay. And you've seen this happen over and over again over the years where Google will come out with a statement saying, this is against their guidelines, you know, and so forth. And they would then go ahead and be like, um, well, it's against the guidelines if you do it this way, but if you do it our way, we're an SEO white hat company, we do it right. And I felt like I couldn't really report on Google in a unbiased way if I actually performed SEO services for customers. Um, so that's one reason. The second reason is I also felt like I want to make, to make sure the SEO community could actually trust me. I want to make sure the SEO community could uh, trust me. And I wanted to make sure that Google at the same time or the search engines could actually trust me as well. So I've had SEOs tell me things that I would never reveal, not even here. I've had Google tell me things and show me things that I would never in a million years, you know, reveal even on here. Um, and this has been going on for the past, you know, 20 or so years now where I've hope I, be, I hope I've earned the trust of the SEO community. And I hope I've earned the trust of people who work at search engines, Google and Bing. Um, and I think that comes from making sure to one, report on things in an unbiased manner. Two, to make sure that the piece of pe people that you're sourcing, you know, you do it in, in, in the right and most ethical way as possible. So I think that's the, some of the reasons why um, I don't do SEO. Okay, that's um, that's really interesting. Um, so just going back to, um... Sorry, just taking you back a little bit, back to the forums. Um, do you, do you, how how integral do you think the forums actually were to the industry? Because, you know, you, you were learning, this is where you were um, actively connecting with people in the early days. Do you think they were really important to actually establishing the industry? Um, yes. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I think you speak to any early SEO I mean, I think almost all of them came from learning stuff and sharing stuff in the forums. Um, and most of those early SEOs have taught the SEOs of today what SEO is all about. I mean, obviously, there's people like Bill Slosky, who may rest in peace. I mean, he was so all over the place on, on in SEO forums, teaching people every single day, not with just like a one word or two word response, but literally paragraphs of responses, mm -hmm. uh, helping people understand it. Uh, Amon Johns, Danny Solomon, Joe Whalen, Helen Lloyd, Martin, Dallin Johnson, uh, Brett Tabke. I mean, you name it, like these industries, this industry has a list of names of people who spent countless hours over the years. I mean, a lot of the people you actually probably interviewed as well. I think John Mueller, yeah. Um, so you did it. Gary from Google as well. He was spent so much time in the forums. Um, you know, most of the people you like, um, uh, uh, Todd Friesen, um, you interviewed, uh, so many people, uh, Greg Bozer. These are all people who were literally sitting in the forums, forum on one screen, um, their SEO projects on another screen and like, just probably like going ahead and saying, oh, this worked for me. This didn't work for me. And this is how they, the SEO community kind of grew up, um, and it returned over the years. But I think these are the SEOs who taught the next generation of SEOs, who taught the next generation of SEOs. Um, and I think those forums are very, very instrumental in the community growing. I don't know if that's with like every for every industry, but definitely with SEO. It was like, you, you know, you didn't become an SEO in the old days without going to the forums. Some people were lurkers that just didn't respond to people or didn't, you know, post anything. But if you ask them, they'll be like, all right, I read something on you know, the old gym world forum or the old webmaster world forums. And that's where I learned to do this or that. I think everybody kind of goes back to the SEO forums days in the early days. You think, um, I mean, we obviously we don't really have the same forum based culture now because I think social media took away quite a lot from that. But do you think we could still benefit from forums now? Well, I think so. The problem is people at least this age, you know, they're just not used to long-winded responses. 
And it's a shame. It's just the new world we live in. People want quick answers to everything. And that's why you get feature snippets in Google. That's why you get, you know, big chat responses. That's why, that's why you know, you get TikTok is so popular because somebody does a dancing video with an answer and, how, you know, this type of hack or that type of hack. Uh, people just want the answer in a very short way to, and a short, short way to consume it, even if it's not necessarily the best answer for that, uh, for that, for that question. Um, so you don't learn the insides and outs by just being told what to do. You have to be taught what to do, and you don't really you don't really get taught in a on a in a tweet. You don't get really taught in a TikTok video. You don't get taught how to do something in a featured snippet. You get maybe what is part of the answer there, but you don't necessarily get the full way to understand. Like in the forums, we were taught how Google Bot crawled. We were given like, yo, download this script to understand. And put into your database a way to see every single time Googlebot crawls, so you can actually pick up on their IP addresses and just to, to drill into how it's working and how it's crawling through your website. Understanding, you know, patterns and stuff like that. I mean, if you couldn't understand, you would re read Bill's blog or you would read something that Bill posted in, in the forums. I don't think a lot of the generation, especially the newer generation, this is obviously the exception of generalizing. And I don't want people to be upset, but it's the new world. People just really want to get content. They're very fast and short answer. And, and Google is showing that with feature snippets, which is kind of funny. And I always joke around how Google ranks feature snippets, short little like two, three sentences. But yet when it comes to writing content, they want it to be, you know, really deep and detailed. But now you need to have these fancy headers with big quotes and stuff because people don't know how to consume content. Or And the truth is, there's just so much content on the web. So I don't necessarily blame them. Like back in the old days, it, was, it wasn't so much content on the web. But now it's just... What do you consume? How much time do you have? And just so much out there. So um, I think we, I think the current generation is missing out on not having the forums that we had in the old days. Although Webmaster World is still pretty popular, still pretty active. Um, some of the Black Hat forums like Black Hat World is pretty popular as well, although content not, not so always so great there. But it's, it's, there are some nice threads there. And like the local search forum uh, from that um, Troy Hawkins acquired uh, several years ago is still pretty active and still pretty good. And then there's the forums like that Google manages, which they probably one of the reasons why a lot of the forums died is because Google has their own forums now. Um, but those are just like really weird things. But there are a lot of top, what are they call them? Top contributors or top experts. I forgot what, call, what their titles are. Um, that volunteers who are who don't get paid by Google actually volunteer to actually answer questions. And Google takes them on a summit every every year or so. So they do have good forums and good answers. There are a lot of forums on the internet, but I think people consume more things on social media like Twitter and uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and so forth. Did you, you actually started um, Search Engine Roundtable as a, was it actually as a summary of the, some of the threads in the forums? Is that right? Yeah. So what I noticed is like a lot of people are posting things in, in forum threads. So with a forum thread would actually go off on tangents. So you might have a forum thread that talks about, I don't know, whatever topic it, it is. And then somebody would actually go ahead and say, well, we'll branch off to another topic. And there will often be lots of gems in a thread that maybe had a hundred posts in it. It might be a lot of little gems in there that people who are too busy to read every single post that anybody made um, would not, would miss. So my concept was, Maybe if I fi hopefully find these gems, I can go ahead and highlight them at a higher level and pull them out of a hundred page thread and just pull out the most important, or I think the most novel ideas from that thread um, into one topic. And that's why I kind of built Search Roundtable was to kind of say, all right, to be a good SEO, uh, you have to go ahead and clients. You have so much, so much time in the day. You need to actually do the job, but at the same time, you also need to read a form. So what if I pulled out a lot of, got rid of a lot of noise and just kind of highlighted the, the most important stuff that I found in threads and I did that. Um, and I probably missed a ton of stuff, but that's why I kind of created search into round tables because I'm going through the threads anyway. I'm like, maybe just, I'll just highlight what I think is the most important stuff. And I still do that to today. Although it's not just forum threads, it's tweets, it's anything that's really like public on the internet and social media that is what I cover. So you launched a SES in 2003, is that right? Officially search engine round table? I think, yeah, in December, I went to SDS Chicago, I think, was the first conference I went to. 
Um, I thought that maybe I should do some live blogging um, and so forth. But I figured also I'll go to this, this, the sessions that people are speaking at and not everybody are going to these sessions too far, they're too busy, they can't afford it. And I'll just highlight the, what people are saying. I did something called live blogging. I wasn't the first to do live blogging, I don't think. One of the first, I think. Um, um, and I, I basically live blog what people were saying in these sessions. And I, people, I, th I thought maybe the conference would be upset because people are taking away money from the conference, but the conference loved it. Eventually, they actually said, you know what, here's a press pass. You can come for free. I used to pay. I, for years, I paid to go to these events um, out of my own pocket just to cover it and live blog it uh, and let people have it for free. Uh, and then they're like, wait, why are you paying for Why are you paying for this? Here's a press pass. Come for free. Obviously, they pay for the flight to the hotel, but they pay for me. I don't have to buy like a $1,500 ticket to the event. Um, so I did a lot of live blogging, which was good because it promoted the conference and it also promoted the, you know, promoted SEO. Um, it also got a lot of information out there from maybe case studies that people produced and so forth. So I think I started with that in December 2003 at SES Chicago, if I remember correctly. Can you remember what the date is of your very first post? Uh, December 3rd, 2nd? In 2003. I mean, 2003? Yeah, I yeah, it's December 2003, the 2nd. 2nd of uh, it's, uh, December 2nd, 2003. It was just like a welcome to, I actually called it the Rusty Brick blog back then. <laughs> so when you started out with your idea of Search Engine Roundtable, did you ever envisage it would become as big as it has or, you know, go for as long as it has? I never envisioned um, it to be big. I don't know if it's big even now. I mean, it gets, you know, tens of thousands of visits, but that's still a very niche, niche type of blog. Um, I never, I guess I never envisioned it to be what it is now. I don't think I thought about it that way. I just thought, hey, I'll just keep notes about what I'm learning about SEO, both at conferences and at on the forums. And I made it public for everybody to access. And eventually people started reading it commenting i think it's how every early blog started it's like people just said this is my diary this is my online diary that people could read and consume and eventually some blogs became very big over the years and some i think most blo early blogs became very big in fact i remember brett Pavkey invited me i don't know 2004 2005 i forgot what year it was to speak at one of the web pubcon super sessions with um some of the big bloggers i'm like why are you inviting me it's like but it, I guess back then, everybody, you know, any new early blogger was big. And that was my first time really speaking at a big event. I think it was like 5,000 people in the crowd. Um, and I look like a baby. I should probably have to find that photo somewhere. <laughs> so you never, you didn't have a, any kind of vision or plan of what you were going to do with the blog. It was just literally just a side hobby, recording your thoughts. That's it. I was basically just keeping track of uh, I feel what's the best way to keep track of what I'm reading and share it. And that's how I did it. I basically posted stuff on a, on a blog. Um, again, like I think a lot of people did that and have any vision for it. I didn't, I didn't have any goals for it. Um, blogging was so new that nobody really knew what it would do. Um, but it's just a very good way. I figure like, if you write something, you remember it. Like one of the tricks is when you're learning something is write it yeah, down, you'll remember yeah. it. So that's how I, you know, remembered stuff. Uh, by writing it down. Um, so that was the plan. And still even today, I don't really have any specific goals or plans for a search engine roundtable. It's just, you know, keep doing, I don't really stop doing what I do. I just keep doing what I do um, without stopping. That makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, it's what, it's been like 20 years. Well, it has, yeah, December 23. So um, it's going to be 20 years in December since you started that blog. How, I mean, how did you keep, how have you managed to keep the motivation with it, uh, doing it all by yourself? Um, actually, have you used um, have you used any other writers to help you? With, um, um... I I have, so I've tried that. Um, what is early on? I initially tried to get some people like Bill and Amon and so forth to actually say, "Hey, you wrote this blog post, this this thread in this forum. Do you want to go ahead and cover it? And you're also in the forums too. If you find good stuff, you want to go ahead and write about it." Early on, people started doing that and they stopped, and it was just hard to do. For certain personalities so at one point i was like you know what forget it i'll just do it myself uh, because being consistent and doing that especially if there's no real revenue model for it and you're not paying them to, you know it is what it is i think i actually sorry i hired tamar weinberg if you remember her um, yeah for yeah a, a year or so to do it as well um 
and she did it for a while. I basically said, write about this thread or write about that thread. And she, you can see a bunch of blog posts from her. Um, but again, it's just something that I felt like search and roundtable, I kind of want to keep it to myself um, at some level. Just I write a search engine land as well. And there's lots of writers there. They're writing the search engine land since it started prior to search engine watch. Um, but those were staff based writers and also contributors. At search and roundtable, it really is just me for the most part. Um, and I can do whatever I want there. Although I do occasionally, like, meaning occasionally, like maybe like a few times a year, like have like a Glenn Gabe or somebody else write a blog post um, on Search and Roundtable. Um, but rare, rarely do I have anybody else contribute these days, ever, really. Do you know how many posts you have written on Search Engine Roundtable? Yes, yeah, somewhere in the 32,000, 32,000. Um, 157 to date. That's pretty impressive, all for one person. Yeah, if you combine, I just, I did the math like a couple months ago. You find search engine land. I think I did over 8,000 posts there, and probably two, three thousand on search engine watch. So I'm well over the 40,000 article how, mark across search topics. How many um How many posts do you write in a day? On average, anywhere from five to ten. But they're short. My a very short post. It's not like I'm writing a huge, massive article. It's usually like three paragraphs. I ten a day. Wow, over twenty years. That's uh, that is impressive. Oh my god. As somebody who's done a lot yeah, of writing, most of it's living. like this person said this, and I quote them and add some more content and uh, information and context around it. Uh, most of it's a lot of it's John Mueller said this, or Gary said this, or this was announced, or this is threads going on. So it's mostly just like uh regurgitating what other people have said <laughs> you want to put it that way yeah but i mean look i you know i write i've done a lot of writing for a living and i know it's really hard even at that level just yeah pushing out that much every day is uh, really for me it's not impressive. i mean it's just something i do i mean some people find certain things to be hard like i find um i don't know fishing hard i don't know i, I can't this is my entertainment literally i this is my hobby i love doing it i love writing stuff about search um, and people don't really understand that per se. It's like, I just, I love doing it. I don't necessarily do it for the paycheck. I make a little bit of money on it, but thank God my main company, you know, really compensates me and we're able to do well with my software development company. But this is like, this is my hobby. This is what I, you know, do. I probably spend, I don't know, two hours, three hours, maybe max a day on it. Not that much. Although it sounds like a lot, but it's not. So I do it from like 5 a.m. to like 8 a.m. <laughs> oh you're like the only other person in the world that gets up at 5 a.m like i do then i thought i was the only yeah, one it's, it's 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 you get a lot done right oh yeah it's time. where it's at 5 a.m is where it's at for sure do you approach your reportage from love of search engines or actually love of the community that's a good question um i think it's really both um like bridging the Google announces this or Google does this and this is what the community thinks about it or this is how the community is reacting to that. I think that's the angle I try to cover um, or community did this or SEOs found this hack and this is how Google and the search engines are approaching to stop that. Google announced this new feature, or I don't know, whatever it might be. Now this is how SEOs or maybe the pay-per-click community are leveraging it to make more money or to rank better or to whatever. So I think that's the, the difference between reading, let's say, Google just announced X, Y, and Z, and that's it. It's more about this is what the community thinks about that announcement. This is how the community is reacting to that announcement. And the same thing goes the other way. You know, I love how the community, how much everybody shares in the community is reporting on it. It makes it easier to report on the industry when people are sharing so much. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly an exciting, fast-moving industry. I mean, one of the things, reasons why I love it so much is because it's constantly evolving and it never stays still and it's just fantastic intellectual challenge all the time of something new almost every day you mentioned there about like the community how much emphasis do you actually put into building actually actively building the community did the community just come naturally or did you really focus on how you could build that yeah, so I mean, I think it does come naturally with the search at a roundtable concept. It's it's all about, you know, getting comments and highlighting stuff from the community. That's how it was originally. Uh, and I love the community so much. I've been part of it. You know, I love the pe people in the community. 
I love the fights in the early days of the Cuban community. <laughs> I love trying to like be the peacemaker sometimes if possible. There was a lot of early fights. I think we have a lot less of that. Oh, I don't great. know. Um, I don't um, know. <laughs> it's different because I don't know. People used to like leave fours. Moderators used to leave because they were upset. It was pretty interesting. People used to leave conferences and so forth. I, I guess it still happens. Maybe I'm just, I don't see it anymore. Um, but yeah, I think it went hand in hand with community, but I do make a very, very um, significant effort to promote people within the community. I always tag people I find who find stuff. Like I always cite people. I try to tag them on their social media profiles, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so forth. I really try to promote what people are saying and their personalities as much as possible. Because again, without the community, um, we wouldn't have any of this. So I think it's really important to not take stuff as our own without citing where it's coming from. If not to cite something that's not publicly announced as well. Like you have to be very careful not to listen on somebody's conversation and like write about it without their approval. So the easiest way to do that is say, this person said this over here. This person said this, this person said this on Twitter. This person said this on LinkedIn. I think that helps a lot. Always to credit the person who said it because if you credit that person who said it, they're going to go ahead and look for more things that are new and exciting and share more and more. And the more you cultivate the community to share, I think the more they get involved and help the community grow. It just it just builds upon itself, which is just great to see. Would you call yourself a researcher or a documenter? Yeah, I don't know if I'm much of a research. I mean, I did a lot of research on things. So like, I will test things to make sure what people are saying are true. Sometimes you can't test things and you have to ask other people to help you test those things. Uh, but also sometimes I'll be like, I'm documenting what this person is saying. So there's a lot of things you can easily see if you have experience with stuff and test it before you report about it. And I've gotten it wrong over the years. Uh, but the good thing is I, the community calls me out if I get it wrong and I can, I can update it. It's a blog post. You can easily modify it, share again that you got it wrong. And I, honestly, I love getting things wrong. I love, I don't get things wrong all the time. Uh, maybe once every month or so, maybe, maybe less. But if I do get it wrong, I will update that post immediately, quote how I got it wrong, say I got it wrong, and share that I got it wrong. Because I think getting it wrong makes you just, uh, makes you smarter just as much as getting it right. What's your most memorable fail getting it wrong? Oh, good question. Um, I guess the biggest one was when Microsoft launched their live search engine that was now about big. I'm like, I think it was like in 2000, I don't know, four, 2005, something like that. I'm like, that's it. Google's dead. There's no way Google's going to be able to compete because Microsoft back then had the operating system and they had the browser. I thought that, hey, this is going to be a big deal. And even if their search quality isn't as good as Google, I think people are going to switch because they're going to be defaulted to switch. I was wrong. Google, people still went to google.com. Eventually, Google built their own browser. They have Chrome, Chrome OS. They have Android now. There was no, no mobile phone back then. And I thought Microsoft would be massive in search back then. And then you look at their stats, they never really did. And even to today, with Bing Chat, it's really making a little bit of a dent, but not much. So it's very interesting. So I was big wrong on, on Microsoft dominating search. I said, I think I wrote a blog post, Bing or Microsoft would be dominant in search in like a few years. And I was completely wrong. Um, in 2018, you got the Search Personality of the Year Award and, you know, your personal brand is probably one of the most recognizable in the industry. Um, so did you ever actually actively consider your personal brand? I know a lot of people now talk about personal brand and developing personal brand. Did you ever actually think about that or was it just secondary to everything you were contributing? Not really. I, I still don't use my name as my handle. Back in the old days, we used nicknames as handles. So I use my company name, Rusty Brick, which is kind of like a nickname as my handle. It's still on Twitter, it's Rusty Brick. On a lot of the forums, it's Rusty Brick. Um, I don't really think about Barry Schwartz as the name, um, but it just goes hand in hand, I guess, with covering so much where people just recognize you. Um, but I don't really think about it building a personal I never went about it like a personal brand I'm very I rather you know I'm not really like the type of person that looks to be on the stage or stuff like that in fact for many many years I refused to moderate any sessions on panels I just said I don't want to I'd rather just cover it and share with the community 
not you know speak on stage but then you know as danny sullivan started to like wind down and move out of that space somebody had to step up for that conference i do love being being the first person to share something i love being the first to break a news item and stuff like that uh but i don't know if i do it for the personal brand purpose but it's nice to be able to see like so many people follow you and sharing what you share at the same time that comes with some hate as well so um it goes hand in hand, but you know, I never thought about it. Like I need to build Barry Schwartz as a brand or something like that. It doesn't really something that I, I didn't really think about it that way. Do you think today people are getting more focused on their personal brands? Do you think it is becoming more important? I think for a while people have been, I think a lot of people think it's important. And I don't think it's not important. I think to, for a lot of people to grow in their careers, they have to having a, brand and where people can say this person's well known in this industry for this and this and that i think, I think it helps them get job opportunities helps them get clients and so forth again i don't sell what I'm, i don't really sell i don't sell seo services so it's not like i'm trying to get business from my personal brand so it's a whole different way of thinking about it whereas a lot of people in the seo community do that and they should they should go ahead and build up their personal brand or the company brand so that they can get business and that earns trust and respect and it builds up their ability to charge what SEO should be charging for their services because they are known as an expert in, you know, I just try to share as much as possible. Obviously, the more people that share my stuff, the more people that read it, but it's not like I'm making a dollar more because somebody is viewing my article five times more. It doesn't work like that. So um, I don't know. There's no monetary reason for me to do that. If that makes sense. But, I mean, obviously building a personal brand to the level that you've managed to achieve you know, has to be quite a reward as a thought leader. You know, there's a lot of value in that. I mean, you know, you're not directly selling SEO service. I mean, if you were to suddenly start an SEO uh, company, you would probably have a lot of people wanting to work with you. But, you know, as a thought leader, you're very much sought after your your opinion. And that has a huge value, but also, you know, personal achievement. Yeah, no, it's, it's always like getting an award. I know, uh, getting that award at PubCon, that that was really nice. It was really meaningful. Um, I got a couple other awards over the years as well. Um, It's nice when people like call you out as being helpful and stuff like that, especially when you get people from the SEO community doing it as well as people from the search engines also, when John Mueller says nice things about you or whatever. Um, You know, when Google, and you get, you, you speak to somebody at Google that you never met that has been running Google search for the past 20 years and they know who you are, like, it's it's kind of like shocking, but yet it means it's flattering at the same time. So yeah, I'm not going to say it's it's not nice, but it's not why I necessarily do what I do. I do it because, I just, again, it's the passion of loving. I love the community. It's the way it changes and how fast it changes. Um, but of course, getting you know those call outs here and there saying it's great, uh, saying you're, what you do is very helpful. People have told me over the years that I've helped them with their careers directly or indirectly. I've helped them build their businesses directly or indirectly. Um, that is super rewarding. Um, and it's an honor to be in a position where, you know, where I kind of, kind of make a difference in this, you know, small little industry if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it's a reward, isn't it? You know, you put a lot of hard work in. It's like, for example, this series I've been doing, it's um, the SEO pioneers. It's an, it's an incredible amount of work. I mean, it, it's not the same as what you've done over 20 years. Um, but it's it's a huge amount of work that goes into it and time. And it, you know, it's hard trying to fit that in with really demanding full-time work. Um, and then, you know, when you it was you actually pinged me um when John Mueller mentioned it on um Google Search Central. And that was just such a huge, amazing feeling because you just put in so much without expecting anything back. It does keep your energy going, but it does. It's nice to have a passion about something, mm. do it for a while, and then get people say, wow, that's really good stuff. Not that you're doing it for any other purpose than to, because you love doing it for yourself, and you think it's you think it's something that you like doing, and it's like a hobby, like you said. It's something you really love. But then if it helps other people, it's like a double win. Um, <laughs> So just going back, you mentioned something before about how you love to break um, breaking stories. You love to, you know, be at the cutting edge and and getting the breaking stories on things. So how are you managing to? How do you manage to keep at the edge of the news? You know, what what are you what are you following? What's your secret? How are you how are you sourcing? 
Yeah, I mean, I follow everything, um, almost everything. Um, all the for all the public forums. Um, I follow a lot of stuff on social, mostly on Twitter, but a lot of stuff on, on social as well across Twitter, um, LinkedIn. Facebook is tricky because a lot of stuff is private and you have to make sure that you have to use like incognito, see if other people see it. Um, people also send me tips all the time, both on social media and via email. Um, so I do stay on top of the, I have tons of RSS feeds and I follow like, I have tons of bookmark. I follow a lot of stuff. I even have some track automatic or stuff technology I built myself to track a lot of stuff to see when things change and so forth. So I just really try to stay on top of everything. Um, I check in the early mornings and I check later, like late afternoons to see what's changing. And then I have dashboards and stuff that I could be alerted of when something big changes and so forth. So it's just being, being able to know where to look, how often to look. And if something needs to be looked at more often, you can set up tools to like track them a little bit faster for you. But again, it's really about in my opinion. The reason that things have helped me, you know, be on top of things more often is because I cite a lot of people in the community and give credit where credit is due. So as long as you treat the sources, you know, as the sources and you respect them and they respect you, I think it just helps. How many hours reading are you doing a day? How many hours do I read this stuff every day? Um, how much are you reading? Probably, are you actually doing? Probably, I don't know, two hours. So we're in two hours, probably less than two hours. I don't know. I read very, very fast, incredibly fast. Um, <laughs> I also talk very fast. I write very fast. Um, I'm, I'm crazy about being super efficient, like insane. Like it bothers, it bothers my wife how crazy I am about being efficient. Like even like stupid things like keeping my phone in this pocket as opposed to my pocket over here because it will save me literally. I can just go like this. I don't have to reach down. This takes an extra. I don't know how long. I don't know half of a second to to actually get your phone in your face. Those types of things. Uh, like I look for ways to cut any step out of the process or even a partial step out of the process to make to be a little bit more efficient so that I can spend more time doing what I need to do and less time doing the other things. Um, which is what my company does, like Rusty Brick Build Software, to make companies more efficient. And that's just how our like, that's my other passion. It's just about how can we make things more efficient to get more productivity out of what a person does or a company does. It's just that's how my brain is kind of works, and it helps me do what I need to do in terms of the SEO side as well. Awesome. Your website, Search Engine Roundtable, it's not being updated. Like the design hasn't been changed in how long? A lot. I actually redesigned it a few years ago. My my development team is so busy with client work that it's hard for me to pull them off the client work to work on my side hobby project. Um, and it's such an old platform, it's going to take a while to update the design and some of the features on it. So I have this new design, which is now well dated, um, which I wanted to implement. Although I have a nice mobile app, people don't like the design of Surgery Roundtable. The Surgery Roundtable app is is really really great way to consume the content as well um but yeah it's something that i need to sorely work on and i probably can't even just implement that new design anymore i have to go ahead and redesign the, the redesign that i have never implemented um just because <laughs> you know how they say but the shoemaker always has oh, the, yeah. the tears in the shoes oh, yeah. and stuff like that but i don't know i kind of almost feel like it, it's just got such a nostalgic feel about it now and I, there's something about it that makes it feel really honest and i almost feel like if you were to like drastically and radically update the design now, you know, we'd be like, oh, what's happened to Search Engine Roundtable? Oh. Yeah, but at the same time, there's so much code bloat on it, like authors, some old, old stuff like authorship, some Google Plus profiles you probably see there. It's like old, old, like legacy stuff that needs to be done. Um, I probably want to do a massive, like, I wouldn't make it look like The Verge or anything, but I'd probably just clean up the code base and launch it and add some basic SEO stuff that, I've been at, meaning to add for a while. The pagination is kind of like all messed up and broken. This is such legacy <laughs> code. It's such old stuff. There's so much old content. And this, I guess, tremendous amount of traffic that it's kind of like a, a scary project to work on. But eventually, I'm going to have to do it. I know it for sure. What platform is it on? It's got custom CMS. It originally was on movable type. I was going to move to WordPress. And I'm like, you know what? No, I'm going to build my own thing. I like to be able to control and build it the way I work. Again, it's about being fully optimized to work so it's actually i when i type it's html um 
a lot of the stuff is not like I have a WYSIWYG editor. I don't want a WYSIWYG editor. I know HTML. I can go ahead and, you know, make things bold and use bullet points and embed images and so forth um, using image tags. So it's most of the CMS is very uh, basic. Um, but yeah, if I were to rebuild it, it would basically be similar to how it is now. Just the code output would be a lot cleaner and the design would be a lot more modern. Uh, but it's a custom CMS. I actually prefer writing in HTML myself as well. It's like whenever I'm in WordPress, I always switch to the code view and never use yeah. the what you see is what you get. But yeah, I just find it much cleaner and much easier to use. Um, so just going back a little bit again, I just wanted to talk a bit more about the SEO community. Um, you know, you've, you've been an integral part of it for 20 years and you've watched its development. How do you think it's evolved over the 20 years? I think it's matured a lot. Um, I think it's no longer a bunch of hackers or... Geeks in their bedroom. Yeah, geeks in the bedroom just like hacking things together. Um, I think it's just a lot more matured. I'm sure there are a lot of people that are um, hacking stuff in their bedrooms, but it's, it's different. You now have like SEOs who are VPs of SEOs at companies. Like who would have thought? I mean... Yeah. <laughs> um, it's way more corporate, it's professional things. Also, like the things that moved a lot off the forums. You have the social media now, that's pretty popular. Um, but it's just great to see like there's a VP or head of SEO or director of SEO in a company. Beforehand, it was like SEO is some type of like icky type of thing that nobody would talk about. Um, and now people take SEOs very serious seriously these days. So I think it's a lot better in terms of being more respected and more professional, but I kind of miss the old days of, you know, things kind of being like a little bit scrappy and um, a little bit, you know, more hacky and stuff like that in the old days. Um, plus it was more, it was a smaller community. So it was much more, uh, you know, everybody kind of knew each other, especially in the forums. Whereas now it's like, there's so many people, like, I know I met you. I know your Twitter handle. Did I really meet you? It's hard to know. Um, so it's definitely a different, um, it's not as like small of a community, but it's, I think for the overall, it's, it's, it's all for the best, I think, to see the, the industry mature so, so much over the past 20 years or so. How do you feel now about social media, where it's at today, you know, with kind of the outrage <clears throat> that we seem to experience? It seems that to now, you know, you, you could literally tweet anything and someone somewhere is going to be outraged by what you're saying. And there just now seems to be so much negativity and hatred and, um, you know, do you not see this? I think this? we always had that. I think we had this in the forums too. Like you would say something in the forums, people would be like, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. There'd be lots of fights. Um, so I don't know if it's changed much. I think it's just, it's, it's a different, I don't know. It's, I don't want, it's, I don't know. I'm not sure how much it's changed per se versus how much more accessible it is and how many more people are in the industry. Um, I think overall, it's actually a lot better than it used to be in terms of um, in terms of the hate and stuff like that. I do think overall, it's been getting a little bit better again because I think also social media um, is also pinned to somebody's name as opposed to just being some type of weird abstract um, avatar that mm -hmm. people used to use, like some you know weird name. And now that people like, on Facebook, you use your real name. On Twitter, most people, not everybody, a lot of people use their real name. Um, and I think it going back to a certain person does give them, like, it's you, you wouldn't talk to somebody face-to-face -face like you would on social media. At the same time, you wouldn't talk to somebody on social media if uh, the same way you would if you use your real name versus, like, a, uh, some pseudo name. But I think it helps a little bit by people using their real names, although a lot of people don't, but most people, a lot of people do these days. You say you get a lot of tips. You must have have had a lot of interesting stories pushed through you, pushed to you over the years. Yeah, a lot. It's hard to. I'm mean, I wrote close to forty uh, over forty thousand articles. Yeah, so it's been a lot. Yeah. So you must get to hear a lot of things that you can't ever publish. <laughs> I've heard a. I've seen a lot. I've heard a lot. I've. Yeah, I haven't covered a lot. Uh, a number of stories over the years that. Would be great to cover, but again, if, if I can't link to something that was publicly said by somebody, I will not cover it. So that's my rule. Um, and I hope never to cross that line in the future. And one way of doing that is to say, if somebody doesn't, if it's not publicly available, that I can link to it in a tweet or a forum thread or a blog post, that I will not cover it. 
Is there any stories that anybody ever sent you that now, looking back, you think, I really wish I had shared that and you didn't at the time for some reason? I don't know. I mean, again, I don't I don't think so. No, I think it would be cool to have shared certain things. I wouldn't mention what they were um, because I can't really talk about them. But I have no regrets of not sharing something that was sent to me in confidence um, that could have potentially hurt either the SEO community, an individual, or even the quality of Google search results. I have no regrets not sharing that type of stuff. Sometimes I'll be sent stuff, um, like a weird bug with Google that could be manipulated. I will send it, you know, I would ask the person who sent it to me, do you, do you mind if I send this directly to Google? If they say yes, I will forward it to somebody at Google that I know and never cover it. I, that probably happens at least once a month. Um, I will ask the person who sent it to me permission to send it to them. Um, and if they say yes, I will forward it over to one or two different people at Google that I know could deal with it, whatever they want to deal with it. If somebody then goes ahead and tweets about that issue, I probably will cover it. But if it's not out there, I'm not going to be the one who's going to go ahead and be like, you're the guy who went ahead and <laughs> made this a bigger deal than it should have been. Um, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to cause issues, if that makes sense. Um, I want to report about what's there. I don't want to be the person that people are reporting about. If that makes sense. <laughs> No, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a huge amount of integrity. You know, you're in a very powerful position. You know, you're in a, you're a position of uh, authority. And it's, you know, it is a massive amount of integrity um, that you follow of what you will and won't publish. And, again, it's, you know, it's obviously why you've got to the position where you are so well respected from both sides, from SEO and search engines, um, because you take that position. Um, and I, I thoroughly, yeah. you know, I 100% agree with it. I would never out I mean, anybody for anything um, unnecessarily ever. Right. I don't think they do it on but people who do it. They just thought of, oh, this is great to share. They don't really think about how it might impact something. Um, I hope I've never done that. I hope I never will do that in the future. Um, but again, if something's publicly out there, I will cover it once it's out there because I'm not the first person to cover it. But again, if it's something that sends me like Google shows me something or some rogue person inside Google shows me something, which I've had before, or or SEO shows me something that's completely like mind blowing. I wish I could tell you what those were, but I'm not going to go ahead and say it. But I've I've received those things, and I continue to see, receive things like that um, over the years. So, yeah. How long have you had a direct relationship with Google? Did they get in touch with you, or did you manage to build that relationship yourself? I question that. I don't know. Um, I don't know how long, I guess since I, I don't know, 2004, 2005, um, I was one of the few people covering the space. I probably met people at conferences. I remember people like Yahoo inviting me to their stuff, having me interview like Tim Meyer back in the old days, Matt Cutts, you know, going on walks with Matt Cutts. Like I entered, I, it's like I went up over to people like say, hey, can we go ahead and, I'm not the type of person like that would go over to somebody and be like, can I talk to you about this or that? Um, I like to sit in the background and then cover what people are publicly saying about it. So um, I'm not the person that kind of like tries to get that interview with that CEO or goes to, I can remember like at the early conferences, they would be like Larry and Sergey Sergi on stage and go to them and take a picture with them. I, you don't see any pictures of me with like, you know, the Eric Schmitz and the, the, the CEO of like, you know, Yahoo in the early days and stuff like that, because I wasn't the type of person that would walk over to somebody and be like, let's take a picture or can I sit with you and, and, and do that? Although there are many, I, I met, I was invited to meet with the privately with, um, who's now the CEO of Microsoft. Um, and um, he was running Bing in the early days and he invited me to like a hotel and to show me the early stuff with Bing. Um, and I, you know, now he's the CEO of Microsoft, which is pretty, pretty impressive. So it's not really Nadell. Um, Nadella, he's basically, he was the brainchild and the person in charge of Bing. And then when the four, Steve Ballmer stepped down, he was appointed, he was an elected or made CEO. Um, and that was cool that I went to the Bing chat AI announcement a few months ago or a month ago. I don't know when this can come out, uh, but that was back in, I think, January or so forth. And um, it was a bunch of YouTubers and some reporters and then like me. <laughs> Up there um, and it was weird because i'm like i a lot of famous youtubers are, are all over the place and i'm sitting there and i'm like i don't want to make a youtube video about this give me access to the platform 
I don't want to speak to your executives. I don't want to speak to anybody. I got your press release. I'm sure it has everything in there. I want to play with it and let me play with it so I can see what, what's there and let other people play with it so I can see what the community is talking about. So that's how my reporting works. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think um, I never like to be pitched stuff. I never like to um, be told from personalities what, you know, what makes sense. Of course, I cover the stuff. But I always like to bring the community's uh, thought process into that as well as possible. You are you driven with like a passion for really being at the cutting edge of the technology? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I love the I love getting like people hate getting like upgrades to their software programs. I love it. I'm, like always, the first to upgrade stuff. Um, I, I like experimental stuff. I love beta stuff. Um, I think that helps a lot. Yeah, for sure. Looking back, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know that what you're going to say to this, but looking back, do you, do you think you would change anything? If you could do anything differently? No, no I don't think so. Uh, what I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think I would change anything. Um, trying to think if there's anything I did. Yeah, there's like maybe one blog post I probably would have written about. I did. Although it, went, it, it met all my guidelines about writing stuff. But outside of that one, it's the one blog post I have in my robots.txt file, if you want to look it up, it's, it's the one blog post, but basically um, it hurt a young teenagers. Um, and that wasn't my intent at all. I didn't think anybody would read it, except for the SEO community, but it ended up hurting uh, a teenager. I guess I can tell the story. You may have heard it before. Basically, there was somebody who posted on social media that um, a girlfriend was getting back at her boyfriend. I guess they were in high school. And the girlfriend basically spammed Google Images. This is probably like 10, 15 years ago. Spam Google Images with, I guess, the class photo of the boyfriend with memes, like little like sayings. And I thought, this is all, this is great. You have some high schooler using SEO tactics to get back at their boyfriend. So I did a story about like how a girlfriend, you know, use SEO to get back at their boyfriend. SEOs would love it. And all of a sudden I saw a ton of traffic to it. I saw like, oh my God, TMZ, CNN, all these major publications and gossip magazines also recovering it. I'm like, why do they care about this stuff? And the family called me from the boyfriend saying, can you remove it? I'm like, absolutely. I just thought it was like an SEO thing. Nobody would actually see it outside of our community. Um, so that I probably wouldn't have covered in hindsight. Um, if I knew it would have got that big and that was super rare for anything to get that big. Um, but overall, outside of that, I don't think I have any regrets. I don't think, should I? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> That's a life well lived, you okay. know? It's a life well lived. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we all make mistakes. Like you were talking earlier about making mistakes. And I think mistakes are really important because if you're not making mistakes, it means you're not trying stuff and you're not trying new stuff. You know, I look back at some early work I did and I still literally now, I all the time, I'm like, oh my God, that was so embarrassing if that was to come out. But then I think, no, do you know what? I was experimenting. I was trying. I was you know, I was working hard to keep trying new things and putting myself out there. So, you know, don't be embarrassed about it. Don't be ashamed. You know, I, I did it. It was awful. And you know what I did? I learned. I picked myself up and I moved on and, you know, just kept going. So yeah. mistakes, you like got to make earlier, mistakes. Yeah. It's all about the, the being wrong. I love, like I said earlier, being wrong, I think is even more valuable than being right. And you learn from those mistakes and you get better from it. So for sure. And I think more importantly, you learn humility as well. And I right. think that's really important to learn. <laughs> um, so sure. it keeps the ego in check, right? So, um, well, Barry, um, you know, we've been talking, I could keep talking, but we have been talking for quite a long time. So I'm going to have to wrap up, but I just wanted to ask you one last thing. And, you know, do you ever sleep? Because honestly, you know, it doesn't seem to matter what time of day I ping you or somebody pings you, you will respond immediately. And like the amount of work you're putting in, it seems like you live online 24 seven. And I just, you know, how, how do you keep up that pace, you know? Yeah, it's a routine. It's being very efficient. I do sleep. I need my sleep. If I don't sleep. I get, I, I need sleep. So I do sleep. Um, although I work very hard when I'm awake, I work very hard. I'm very efficient. So it's, I get a lot done in a, in a very efficient about how to get things done. I'm very productive. So, um, and having a routine helps with that as well. So, um, it looks like I don't sleep, but I definitely do sleep. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Barry, I have to thank you uh, for your time. And I've been really looking forward to talking to you. And um, thank you so much for coming on. And um, my pleasure. Thanks so much sharing for having your me. Pass. I appreciate it. Okay, yeah. Barry, thank you thank very you. much. You take care. You too.